so hello and welcome to From Stoicism to Complex Problem Solving, How Data and People Can Save the World, BGS Advantage webinar in partnership with IE University. I just wanted to take a second to highlight BGS's relationship with IE uh, and the scholarship opportunities that they offer uh, our members exclusively. Uh, IE, IE has been associated with BGS since 2015, and they welcome all BGS members to their master's degree program with a scholarship that covers up to 25% of the tuition fee. You can find out more about visiting or uh, by visiting IE University's page on our website. Uh, I also want to introduce our speaker. It's my privilege today to introduce Guillermo de Haro. Uh, he is the academic director for the graduate program at IE University's School of Science and Technology. Guillermo has been teaching at IE for 20 years and is an entrepreneur in the technological projects and is a partner at Jot Down Culture Magazine. Uh, he, has a strategic, uh, he was a strategic development manager at Technicolor Entertainment Services, digitizing the company, uh, COO at Work Center SGD and consultant at IBV Corp. Please join me in welcoming Guillermo. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for everybody, everybody for coming. Uh, amazing audience. Uh, I see that um, the, the only thing between you and, and going to bed or having lunch, it's, it's, a, it's a great expectation. So I, I will try to uh, do my best today. So let's begin, give me a second. Uh, as our host said, please feel free to uh, ask via chat an answer because uh, normally I make questions during the presentation. Uh, thanks for those of you that have the camera connected. I understand that the other ones are with the pyjama because of what they say or trying to win a non-blinking contest. Um, and, and, and first of all, why we have this, this conversation, this conference, I don't know how many of you joined because of the stoicism. How many Stoics do we have here? Do we have people that is interested in the Stoicism? Philosophy? We have philosophers, 38 participants right now. Colton says into Stoicism. Somebody else? No, okay. How many of you are interested in data? Big data, data analytics? You're here because of the world data. Paulina is here because of the data. I have Shane. Complex problem solving, because I, I have a lot of nice keywords. Yeah, this is like a clickbait uh, presentation <laughs> with a lot of nice keywords to attract the audience. Okay, Paulina and Colton are also into into complex problem solving. Nobody else. The rest of the of the audience was not expecting to answer questions so early. Okay, let's go on then. Well, the main reason why we're here today is because of the big questions of life. Yeah. We, 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 what is the meaning of life? Uh, what well, we know is 42, yeah? We have personal interest in data and stoicism, Khalil strategy and problem solving, Mazin data analytics. Yeah, here we go. Um, and any moment in our lives, we made uh, this type of questions. Why we're here? What is the meaning of life? Uh, how can we do, how can we live a good life? Um, and normally I like to begin with that, okay? Why I'm here today? I know somebody else more interesting, like for example, George Clooney. Okay, basically, George doesn't have a doctorate. Okay, uh, we have been telling him for ages. I worked in the entertainment industry. Uh, I was a strategic development manager at Technicolor in Burbank. I would have people from the States here. And uh, well, the, the, basically, Technicolor was a company that made uh, 35 millimeters film strips and that was going to disappear. That was chemical industry. So, my job was to digitize the company, to enter into video games. Uh, media asset management and stuff like that. Um, more reasons why I'm here today. Well, I studied engineering. I am a telco engineer. Uh, do we have engineers in the room? Any other engineer? Uh, Shane is an engineer. Nice. Carlos is switching on the camera, maybe because he's an engineer. No? Yes, he is. Okay, that's the spirit. Okay, the analog digit. <laughs> Nobody else, no more engineers? Okay. Well, I studied telecommunication engineering, but you know, I, I made a lot of 
uh, projects while I was at the university. And uh, I ended up working for a consultancy firm. Everybody has something dark in their past, okay? In my case, I was a consultant. Do I have consultants in the room? Is there any consultant? Anybody working as a consultant or has worked as a consultant? Nobody from the dark side? Okay, so I work as a consultant for a company. And yeah, we have a banker here, Mason. It is more or less the same. Thomas work as a consultant. Gereon, dark side, Bundaba, Gereon. Uh, that analysis is for business. Kiwayas is more or less the same. Yeah, I buy it. I buy it. Well, you studied in, uh, oh, okay, I see. So the point is that working as a consultant, I discovered that I needed some other tools. Uh, it was a business consultancy that were making business plans and different types of plans and PLs of the time. So I decided to make an MBA at IE Business School. Um, coming from Bilbao, or Bilbao, the biggest city in the world, is where the Guggenheim and Athletic of Bilbao is, going to Madrid was, was, was like something big, but that I was a life changing experience. Uh, I made my MBA there in parallel with my first doctorate. Uh, yeah, I have two doctorates. It's, it's a long story with the sound of me. The point is that I discovered a completely new world, something completely different. The way they were teaching with case studies from an engineer when everything is set up, okay? You have the formula and the result with the right solution and everything works. And suddenly you have case studies with many different alternatives and outputs. And it's more important the process and you need to understand many things. People, soft skills, hard skills, operations, marketing, everything reshaped my mind. I wrote three case studies as a student. And when I finished my MBA in a, in a, in the, in the, in, in the, in, in, with the cum laude in the top three of my promotion, they gave me the opportunity to join IES teaching and research assistant in the IES and IT department. And well, of course, I, I took the chance. Uh, I work uh, at um, I full time for a couple of years. And after finishing my doctorate, I moved to the corporate world by remaining as uh, adjunct faculty and collaborating with IE many different activities, for example, in the workshop of um, how to teach cases and how to write cases. I have I have written uh, more than 10 case studies. Oh, we have algorithms here. And uh, well, after that, uh, I wrote books. Uh, I came here to talk about my book, by the way, the conference is just an excuse. Um, my first book is called Corleone Business School. It's about how to learn management, watching the movies of The Godfather. Have you watched The Godfather? Is there anybody here that has not watched The Godfather? The Godfather is mandatory, okay? It's it's something mandatory. Godfather fans? Best movie ever? Okay, Alan Ferrer is on board, Gary on. Well, the point is the following. When I was doing my, my master, my MBA, uh, Harry Costin, our, our uh, strategy, yeah, Andrew and Pranav agree also, Khalil, yes. Okay, let's do something. Uh, I have a PDF with an English version of my book, Call You on a Business School. It's how to learn management watching the movies of The Godfather. Any of you that want it, ask at the end, uh, send an email at the end of the conference, and, and you will get a copy of that PDF. Um, and basically, one of our, our professors told us to analyze the corporate culture of a company. And I said, this is tricky. Because you told us that to understand the corporate culture, we need to look inside the company. We need to take uh, into account symbols and, and uh, uh, qualitative aspects that we cannot see in a big corporation. So I'm going to miss a lot of things. And, and Harry said, OK, I buy your argument. What is the solution that you propose? And he said, let me do it about the Godfather. I can look inside the family Coleone, and I can take a look at what is going on there at the corporate level, at the cultural level. I made that analysis, and after that, I made the analysis of the whole strategy of the company, and then I made an analysis on uh, uh, what could be a consultant reviewing the corporate strategy of the three movies of the saga. This ended up being a book uh, called Management Lessons with the Godfather, and then we made a modification called uh, Corleone and Business School. And on top of that, I have made a comic to try to, to teach uh, my students economics, uh, learning how to cook and stuff like that. Uh, I, I had a, a radio show called The Economic Spectator because my, my second doctorate is in economics. So I am, I am a, an engineer with uh, an MBA, uh, a master in science in, uh, in uh, telematics, and a, a master in arts in cinema and television. Uh, I wrote comics and several books. And my last book is about philosophy. 
in the small book of historic philosophy. Um, and how is it possible that an engineer is, is writing a book about philosophy? What is, what is the meaning? What is the reason for something like that? Okay, why, why this is so important for us? Uh, and why that's one of the reasons why I'm here today. Uh, give me a couple of minutes and I will explain you. This, this is called a spoil, uh, a cliffhanger, okay? This is to get your attention uh, for two, three slides while I talk about something else. Another reason why I'm here today is because of this man, Iklak Sidhu. He's our dean at the School of Science and Technology. I was well known as a business school for many years, but now I is a university with five schools. We have the School for Design, uh, Architecture and Design, the School of Law, we have the School of Economics, Politics, and Global Affairs. We have, of course, the business school. And now we have the School of Science and Technology that is led by the Bishop of ICLAC, who is a legend in the tech world, 75 patents. And uh, he came here last year to uh, turn around completely what we're doing with many great ideas, like, for example, the community of the Input Accelerator with top uh, researchers from all over the world and projects in many different areas. So now that you know more or less why I'm here, the question is why you are here today? Why this conversation? Why this, this seminar was of interest for many of you? Well, most probably, as some of you said, data was something that brought your attention. Now, uh, do you know these, these, did you know videos? Have you ever heard about these videos of five to six minutes that began in year 2010? that are basically data with not much context explaining some aspects. Have you ever seen any of them? Did you know? For example, we grew from 38 to 45 participants now. Sounds familiar to Thomas? Hmm? Okay, if you search for them in YouTube, they are very easy to find. Khalil El Hariri said that has never uh, heard about them. Luisa, don't think so. So if you search for Did You Know, you will see that every year, every two years, there is one of these videos, and many different sources are making them because the idea is very simple. Just in five to six minutes, no more than that, try to explain with data what is the competitive environment. And in this competitive environment, if you get any of these videos, probably you will discover that they talk about political aspects, economical aspects, uh, social demographic aspects, technology. And at the end of the day, they're giving us a view of, of this pestle, of this environment, the competitive environment we are in. And basically with data, normally with write, we get two main conclusions. Everything is going too fast, and there is a huge amount of data and growing data. Have you ever heard the word intoxication? Intoxication by intoxication, in, in, intoxication by information. Well, that's that idea that we get here. And it's not only that, probably something else that you know or heard, because it's, it's consultants, consultants everywhere. They said that every time is that we're in a book environment, okay? Volatile uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. This is our competitive environment. So we have been learning a lot of tools at university, in business schools, in many other institutions, and suddenly some of those tools apparently are not working in this environment because everything is super fast and everything is uncertain. In fact, one of the disciplines that, uh, that apparently is going to be the future is complex problem solving. The World Economic Forum has been for the last 10 to 15 years saying that one of the most important, and it's, and it's scaling up, okay, in the, in the list of the top 10 is scaling up, complex problem solving is one of the most important skills employers are going to search for. What is the idea of complex problem solving? Look, the basic problem is a problem we know how to solve. There is no uncertainty and we know the tools. We all agree in the tools. For example, a recipe, okay, cooking. But not for me. For me, it's a complex problem solving. Yeah, but for most of the people, it's a simple problem. A complicated problem is manufacturing a plane. Manufacturing an airplane is a set of small, simple problems. That there are so many that when you put them together, end up being complicated problems. So you solve it again with, with a different approach. You have more uncertainty. You need a group approach. The human factor is more important. Politics and negotiation are more important. But this is taken to the next level when you talk about complex problem solving. A complex problem is a problem that you have not solved before. Nobody has ever solved before. For example, having a child. Do you have a child here? Anybody here with children? Do we have children? I have two hooligans of seven and 10 years old. Joshua has two, Carlos has two. 
Luis Pablo has another two. Okay. In fact, I have 2.13. I was told that the, the, that was the appropriate rate. And I have the, my two kids, and with another uh, with another woman, I have uh, the the thirty percent of the time of, it, of the German princess who lives in Munich. <laughs> uh, Thomas says one is slightly pressed twenty months. Thomas, you are my target audience right now. Having a child is a complex problem solving or not? Do, do they have a manual? Do they come with a manual where you can check? Are there instructions? Is there any keyword that you can use to switch them off or anything? No. No, not at all, yeah. So, yeah, but we have a lot of literature about how to take care of a child. We, we, I mean, people have been doing this for ages. How is it possible that this is a complex problem? Look, we know a lot about pandemics. There is a lot of information about pandemics. We have a lot of information about the, the Spanish flu from 100 years ago, which, by the way, was not the Spanish, okay? Sorry for this commercial break. I mean, they, uh, there was a war at that moment, and Spain was the only country reporting cases, but uh, it, it, it never it never began uh, here. The point is the following. Regardless, we know all this about pandemics and how to address them and how to solve them. What we'll turned the COVID-19 into a complex problem solving, where some decisions from politicians, for journalists, for many different people, that at the end of the day, turn a pandemic into something that we have never faced before locking in many places everything and stopping the economy up to some extent that we have never seen. So a pandemic is not a complex problem, but suddenly it was turned into a problem, into a complex problem because of the decision that people make. So nowadays, one of the most important skills is to learn how to solve this type of problems that we have never faced before. Uh, here we know about the debt. There is a lot of debt in the economy. We have dealt with the debt before. Yeah, yeah, but now we have inflation. And now we have... Uh, uh, more countries with that than ever. And now we don't have the situation. So all these elements are reshaping how we solve this problem. That's, by the way, that's my next book. I came here to talk about my book, I told you. And if you want to take an idea of the complexity sciences, Castellani and Gerrits developed this map that they update regularly, okay? And here you can see that we talk about cybernetics and artificial intelligence. We talk about economics, complex system theory, but we also talk about psychology, and we also talk about other aspects, the human health factor. So all these different um, tools we need to use to try to address these type of problems. And how can we survive in this new world? It's full of data on one side. On the other side, we have a lot of problems that we have never faced before because of this situation with uncertainty, with a new world being reshaped. And, and we have a lot of challenges in front of us, and we want to live a good life. We want to have a, a, a good decision. We want to make good decisions. And most of what we have left, we don't know how to use. This is where the stoicism appears. The stoicism is a science-based philosophy. It's an approach that was developed 3,000 years ago. And what we discovered right in this book is that we are still using it today every day, regularly. I have been teaching a stoicism without knowing it for 20 years. And um, why stoicism is so important? First of all, the main goal is to answer the question, how to live a good life, how to achieve happiness, how to uh, become and enjoy even in the most terrible situations. And they do this with a scientific approach. They do this using tools that we all know. And it's very, very amazing to see historically how a stoicism has been coming and going, coming and going every time the talk times were coming. Or as the as the song says, when the going gets talk, the, the, the stoics get going. Okay, that, that's more or less the idea. So how can we apply a stoicism into this? First of all, let's take a look at decision making, a basic decision making. This is something that those of you that are consultants or work in a strategy perfectly know. Okay, this is Mitchburg, Henry Mitchburg, he's a classic. The Canadian master with his book, uh, Safari to a Strategy, or, or the, the Strategy Council. So the idea is very simple. First of all, we're, we're in a position, in, in, at any moment, we're in a position, and, and we take a look internally and externally. We look at what is outside and the opportunities and the competitors and everything that is outside, because we watch a did you know video. And then we look inside to what we want, what we want to be, what we are, what we enjoy, what we like. Or as the Greeks said, know yourself. 
So now that you have looked inside and outside, by the way, have we ever heard about this before? These tools to analyze internally and externally weaknesses, strengths, opportunities, uh, and, and, and uh, threats. Have, have, do, you, do you know about this? Have you ever heard? You know it, how is it called? Yeah, it's the SWOT, you also know it. It's the SWOT analysis. It's a tool that was developed in the 50s, it's anonymous, yeah, and it's widely used everywhere. Internal analysis, external analysis. The SWOT analysis is one of the most classic tools that we all know that we have used. So once you make this, this analysis, you decide that you want to go to a new place. So I am in this position and I want to go to a new position. I want to make uh, an MBA. I want to study this degree. I want to go to this webinar. Uh, and I expect that changing this situation from point one to point two, yeah, will make me better. I will have a better position. I will have a better life. And to do that, I develop a plan. I do a plan. I change, I modify my resources. I change what I'm doing to go from point one to point two. That's the design of the strategy. I analyze where I am, I analyze the environment of myself, I decide what is my target, and then I develop a plan to go to the target. This is classic strategy. And we get to that point in a moment, Fred, but you, you were very close to that. That's the spirit. So what happens when I implement? When I implement, Things that I thought I will be able to do, I cannot. This is the non-realized strategy. And things that I never expected that were going to happen, they happen. This is the emergent strategy. The point is that I ended up in a completely different place. Okay? So if I am in point number one and I want to go to point number two, the problem is that when I implement, there are things that I cannot control that take me out of the path. And I must make corrective decisions to try to reach that point, or if the change is so great to completely reshape my strategy, which is what happened during the COVID. Look, this is basically decision-making. This is basically a strategy. Everything that we do in an MBA is that when you study operations, finance, marketing, whatever discipline, is basically to do this process in a more precise and controlled way. But this is the basics for anybody. To make decisions, this is what intuitionally or on purpose we all do. So, how do we know if a decision is a good decision? Well, we need to talk about Alice in Wonderland for this. Do you know Alice in Wonderland? Do you remember? Have you read the book? What's the movie? Alice gets lost after following a rabbit, goes down a hole and appears in a magic world. And at one moment, following a path, Alice gets lost and the path divides. And then in that spot, there is a cat that appears and disappears, the Cheshire's cat. And Alice asks the cat, what path should I take? And the cat says, where do you want to go? And Alice says, I don't mind. And then the cat says, then it doesn't matter. So what is the point about this? Look, there are two types of people in life. The ones with clear targets and the ones without them. The first ones, Use the second one to achieve your targets. What is your target? What is your target in life? What is your target coming to this webinar? What is your target doing a master program? Every time you make a decision, you must have a clear target. If you don't have a clear target, you don't know if a decision is good or bad. A good decision is a decision that takes you closer to the target. A bad decision is a decision that puts you apart from the target. If you don't have a clear target, you don't have criteria to determine if the decision is good or bad. And you know what? I have been teaching this for 20 years. I was a strategic development manager for a multinational American company. I have been teaching it at one of the top business schools in the world. And I discovered that Seneca already said this 2,400 years ago. If you don't know to which port you were sailing, no wind is favorable for you. So I discovered that these people have been for ages teaching management. They knew everything about basic management. And then I went to the Godfather. Once that you know what is your target, the next step is to develop alternatives. Okay, so we, 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 we determined that you all know the Godfather, yeah? Spoiler alert. What is the target of the Godfather family? The target of the Godfather family is to go back to legal business. They are mobsters, but they want to go to, to legal business. 
but there are many different ways to reach that point. And what happens here? Don Vito Corleone says, I will make you an offer you cannot refuse. Okay? And he is going to he is going to try to take the family to the legal business. Uh, well, how? Basically, when you wake up in the morning, you discover the screen of your laptop bleeding oil under your sheets. And then suddenly, Michael Corleone takes over and is the new CIO of the company. I, Marcus, Michael says, okay, to, to take the, the company into the legal business, I don't need mobsters. I need, anybody knows what, what Michael needed? Anybody knows what Michael wanted? Is there any lawyer in the room? Do we have lawyers in the room? If there is any lawyer in the room, can I ask you to leave for a second? I'm going to talk about lawyers. Michael. Yeah, Guerrero said legal guys. Exactly. Worse than mobsters. Okay. The point is that you're going to find a lot of people that says there is no alternative. This is the only solution. There are two main reasons why this happened. First one, they don't have the, the capability or the creativity to develop alternatives. For many years, when I was teaching a strategy in law courses, one of the things that I did was to include a session about creativity for decision making, creativity for problem solving. The other reason why people say there is no other alternative is because they want to convince you that the alternative that they want is the only one acceptable. Okay? So developing alternatives is something very important because when you are in the process of implementing, if corrective measures are not enough, maybe you need to change a lot. And having developed alternatives will help you modify on the goal without losing the target, without losing the vision of the perspective. Clear targets, development of alternatives, and something also very important, alignment. I mean, in every decision-making process, to achieve your targets, you are dependent on other agents. And you cannot control the rate, those agents. So how do I apply this practically? Every time I go to teach, I ask the students, what is your target? Why you are here? Do you remember my first question? Why I'm here today? Why you are here today? Of course, sometimes you have uh, made a pre-assessment of that. You cannot ask, for example, today in a 45 minutes conference, I cannot ask each of you what is the target, what are you expecting from the conference? But when you can do it, this is differential. Because at the end of the day, the people want to learn. And, and, and they have an expectation. But you don't have the information about the expectation, expectation. When we make that analytics, when we make predictive models, we try to infer what is going to come in the future. So all these disciplines of machine learning that we have right now with data is basically the idea of getting information from the people to make better decisions. And sometimes, within the data information, try to predict or detect or modelize what is going to happen in the future. Because I said before that a good decision is a decision that takes us closer to the target. But when I say that, I'm talking about the future. And when we talk about the future, there are things that we cannot control, there are things that we cannot see, and there is a lot of information that we cannot process. And that's the big deal in this process. I gave you an example again. Some years ago, I was teaching a strategy course, 40 sessions, and the first thing that I was uh, that I did was to ask the, the class, what is your target? And they introduced themselves, and many of them were coming from the pharma industry. So I have prepared a course focused a lot on innovation and digital technology. So, so that was the flavor of the more regarding the strategy. But many of them were coming from a highly uh, legislated industry. So I, thanks to this process of what is your target with this uh, course, I could adapt with that information the course for them. The course was a good course, but this was what's much better. Think about when, when you enter into a store, what's the first thing that happens when you enter into a retail store? Do you have somebody coming to you? How can I help you? What do you want? Give me data. Give me information. Tell me what you want or what you need. Uh, by the way, when you go to Google, what what do you type? What do you type there when you go to Google? Can anybody tell me? That's why companies have balance scorecards, exactly, Mason. What happens when you go to Google? What do you tell Google when you go to the search engine and you type there? You tell Google just your, your 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 most your most. What I want to know is something. Yeah. 
You ask what you want to find out, says Thomas. Let's, let's put it in a different way. You are showing Google your most inner and unconfessable desires, things that you would never tell to anybody else. You go there and you type. We all type. We all do that. We trust in Google with our secrets. Okay, we enter into a store, we don't tell that, we go to people that we know, we don't tell that, we go to Google and we type it. And it's there in a server somewhere in the world. And with that data, they build a company with a business model and solving the need of discovering, finding out, helping the people. So what is the best way to learn how to make good decisions? What is the best way to be a good strategist? Basically to play poker. Do we have people here that plays poker? Do you play poker? I love poker. I'm writing a book that is called Poker and Management. It's to justify the addiction with my wife, sorry, honey, this weekend you stay with the children. I have to go to, to, to research for the book, yeah? In fact, some years ago, I made a, a croupier course and I have a croupier diploma, yeah? Just in case I want to dedicate to a decent job in the future and leave this teacher thing. The point is that when I was learning there, I discovered something amazing. Look, when I was watching a football match, a basketball match, a tennis match, I could tell you if a player is performing well or not. But when I was looking at a poker game, I could not do that. So I asked, and this is funny, my wife is a good friend of one of the uh, top professional female poker players, Leo Margaret, and Leo told me something that I'm going to share with you. It's an amazing learning. Leo said, Guillermo, good poker players, when they win, they win a lot. When they lose, they lose a little. What do you think is the most basic learning a poker player must make? What do you think? Two heads, said Zachary. Yeah, true. Don't go broke, says Andrew. Absolutely. Keep the flame alive. When to fall, says Tamara. Good, good. Ah, we have more pocket players than I thought. More ideas? Risk versus rewards, says Alan. Absolutely. Absolutely. Anybody else? Okay, look, everything that you say is correct, but it's linked to something more important, more basic. I'm going to give you a clue. He weighs his bias and variances. Good, we need to know the rules. Yeah. We need to know the rules and make calculations. Mathematics are important. That's why I began using poker for decision making. I'm going to give you a clue. Leo said, when they lose. She did not say, if. What is the most basic learning a poker player must learn? It's impossible to win all the time. You will lose. As Thomas says, you are going to lose. And, and that's why all the other things are so important. Look, poker is a decision-making game, as Zachary says, with incomplete information, where to achieve your targets, you are dependent on other agents that you cannot control, but you can influence. So the most basic thing a poker player must learn is that it's impossible to win all the time. You're going to fail. The most basic thing a decision maker must learn is that it's impossible to make it right all the time. In the long term, you don't have all the information. You cannot see the future. So when you make decisions, you are going to make mistakes. And this is super important. Why? First of all, because when I was going to make my MBA, I was expecting to learn this millenary and ancient knowledge that goes from MBA to MBA that will allow me to never make mistakes and dominate the world. And I discovered that this is not going to be there. And as Mazen says, it's basically the scientific method, trial and error. You must have a procedure to make decisions. So whenever you make mistakes, and you are going to make mistakes, you learn from them. And then the probability of making a mistake is reduced in the future. That's why experience is so important. That's why in the MBAs, we use frameworks and tools that help us structure information and understand what we make a mistake, why this happens from a qualitative or quantitative perspective, so we grow and we reduce the probability of making the same mistake. 
And that's why complex problem solving is so important because in those cases, we're facing situations where we don't have that extra tools that we developed during the time. Do we get the idea? Everybody clear up to this point? Any doubt or question? Masson says clear. Okay, something very important. Yeah, I've losing this part of learning and in time winning it. That's the goal. Good point, Sergey. Clear for Andrew. Look, I know that a lot of people says that failure is fantastic. Failure is great. Embrace failure. Love failure. I'm not a guru of failure. Okay. Failure sucks. Uh, you feel very bad. You may lose a lot of money or even worse. The problem is that failure is like Thanos, inevitable. Okay? So we have to learn how to deal with that. And that's something that the Stoics learned how to do many years ago. And probably you have listened, you have read this pray. God, give me grace to accept with serenity the things that cannot be changed courage to change the things which should be changed, and the wisdom to distinguish the one from the other. So this is one of the basis of the Stoicism, the dichotomy of control. Understand what you can control and what you cannot control. How was possible that the Stoics were doing that? Look, well, basically, they considered that they needed to study three topics. First, ethics, so how people behave. They studied people internally. They were the Daniel Kahneman of the, of the moment. Then, physics which is external. So I studied the people and how they behave and they make decisions. Then I studied the nature and the laws that appear there, how, how the competitive environment works, and then to connect the behavior of the people with the environment, we have the logic. And the logic determines this relation of the people with the environment. Those are the three main disciplines, okay? And, and they included grammar, they included other tools, but basically, the target is this one to understand what is happening and make good decisions. I need to understand the people that make decisions, the environment where they're making it, and how is the relation. That's the idea. And what do I need to make good decisions? Basically, four virtues wisdom, learning capability, courage to do what must be done. Once you have cleared the decision that is a good decision, you must implement, you must fight against yourselves, even against your fears. Justice, a, a, a sense of fairness. A sense of playing with the same rules. We agree on the rules. We work together with the rules. We may disagree in some in some areas, but there must be a common ground. And then the temperance to control yourself, understanding that the others are different, being empathetic. With this virtual, uh, with these cardinal virtues, you can have a good life if you follow the if, if you learn and you follow the, the other the other learnings of the stories. So. They develop a lot of things that, that we, we use it here today. Men are discovered not by things, but the views which they take of things. I mean, the perspective, not the reality. And this is linked to the storytelling. Steve Jobs said that the most powerful person in the world was a storyteller. And that's the point. Nowadays, we have a lot of people saying, oh, no, data will kill the story. No, the story is always on top. A good story will convince people. We remain there. I haven't worked in the entertainment industry. I wrote a comic to teach people economics. Trust me. And those stoics, those, those Greeks and Romans from 2000 years ago, we talk about them today because they were so great as storytellers that their stories remain till today. People compile them. They're, they're letters that were sent. They were just speaking, but orally, people was remembering and reprising and rewriting to, to take them up, up to today. So storytelling is super important. You can make the best decision. You can have an amazing argument with a lot of data. If you are not able to express it, focus on the audience, it's not going to work. So this is an amazing tool that we need to learn today, storytelling. Why? Well, because at the end of the day, we need to work on ourselves. We need to be there ourselves to be a better person. and. All this is coming originally from three Greeks that Eduardo Bono, one of the fathers of credibility, called the Gamma Three, which are Plato, Socrates, and Aristotle. Socrates, 
he used the, the Socratic method, which was basically to be an uncomfortable and annoying uh, asker. Why? Why do you say that? Why that is the truth? Uh, why this is not the truth? Why this is different? Why? And making all those questions, he was eliminating what wasn't the truth to try to focus on keeping the truth. Then we have Plato with the myth of the cave. What we see are shadows of reality. We don't see reality. We don't have all the perspective. We don't have all the information in the table. So take that into account when you make decision. You are not really seeing what is going on. You have only part of the picture. And then we have Aristotle, who developed the logic and who developed the taxonomies. Let's make definitions. Let's make it clear so we all discuss on the same page. This is a table. So what is a table? It's four legs. Yeah, but if you sit in the table, oh no, that's a chair. Okay, let's differentiate the table from the chair. And regardless, this in the long term was seen as a tool that limited the creativity. It was fantastic because this created a base where we all agree, a common ground. One of the problems that we have nowadays with polarization all over the world is that we broke the common ground. Things that we all agreed on are breaking every day. No, but they have alternative facts. If we don't agree in the facts, then we have a problem because we don't have a common ground to build and discuss and argue because we may disagree in many things. So that was the basis of, of, this, of this philosophy. And then the Stoics came. And the Stoics came with Theron de Thitio, who was the founder. And then we have a big Tito, who was a slave and ended up as a, as a wise man. Seneca from Cordoba, Spain at that moment, it was Roman. And Marco Aurelio was the most powerful person in the world at that moment. And, and Marco Aurelio, who was an emperor, wrote and thought about how to be a better person, how to live a good life. Uh, and in his meditations, he was every day thinking about all these learnings and sayings that he could use in, in, in the stressful decisions he had to make. And you know the funny thing? The logic of Aristotle was amplified and developed by the Stoics. And was amplified in a way that this logic, those syllogisms that we know, if A is B and if B is C, then A is or not. Okay, we may have fallacies, biases. The point is that this logic developed by the Stoics to make sure that they were making good decisions and that everybody could reach the same point, the same agreement, was used by George Bull uh, to develop a mathematical language. The algebra of Bull, the Boolean algebra was based on the logic from the Stoics. And you know what? Claude Sanon, which I studied at the university, developed all the modern information theory and developed all the basis of all the computers that we have today with Fourier and the mathematics to turn from analog to discrete, but that's another story. But Claude Sanon developed the information theory using the algebra from Wood. In fact, the first academic paper on the topic by Shannon was published in the philosophy journal because he was talking about philosophy. He was talking about the logic from the Stoics that was starting to algebra by Bull and it was starting to solve the computers can use to be faster, better, and solve the problems that we're solving today. If we're today in a computer be assumed discussing, it's because 3,000 years ago the Stoics developed the logic. That's the power of thinking. That's, that's the influence of these thinkers at the moment. And how do we practically learn from this? There is no less fortunate man than the man that is forgotten by adversity. We need to test ourselves. We need to challenge. We need to solve problems. The only way to learn to solve problems is to confront problems. What do we do in business schools? What is my job? My job is to create problems to my students. I love my job. And that's what I learned when I was making my MBA. So we simulate the problems that they may confront in the reality. And we do it taking into account what is around us. I mean, we can ignore reality, but we can ignore the consequences of ignoring reality. So we must have, we must have a fit in the ground up to some extent. And this is what we have done during the years. Uh, we published an article some years ago at the Sloan Management Review about cybersecurity, saying that companies were focusing mostly on solving the, the problem of intrusion, but you're going to be uh, hacked. It's a question of time, money, and, and a little bit of luck. If anybody wants to hack you, they will be able to do it. So what you need to do is, of course, you need to put measures, but you need also to put measures to detect if you have been hacked, because you're going to be hacked. It's impossible to avoid being hacked. The only way to avoid being hacked is to put your computer unplugged with no energy and closed in a safe case. It's absolutely useless, but it's super safe. So if you want to use it, then it's going to be less safe. 
So there is a commitment there. So first, put measures to avoid being hacked. Second, detect if you have been hacked because you're going to be hacked. And third, in case you have been hacked, have a clear policy so everybody knows what they have to do. So those three, those three approaches were basically the approaches that the places that that performed better during the pandemic used. Put measures to avoid being infected with the virus, but as soon as you have them, control if anybody has it and put a clear policy to tell me what people need to do in that case. If you do these three things, then the impact is going to be lower. Trying not to be infected by the virus is stopping the economy it doesn't make sense in the long term. So more things that are important from the Stoics, and this Francisco de Cabrera, you guys, is a Spanish Stoic from the from the uh, 16th, 18th century. Uh, and and uh, basically, the Stoicism is recurrently reappearing among us. And he said, may the gods give you years, the rest will be up to you. For many years, I was saying to my students, I wish you luck. And since I became uh, interested in Stoicism, what I'm telling them is, okay, I'm going to wish you that you don't have bad luck. You don't need good luck. If you don't have bad luck with what you have done, you can take responsibility, accountability, and you can achieve your targets. Um, who is also solving problems uh, that have never been solved? Well, some years ago, year 2007-2008, we have 54% 54, 54 youth unemployment in Spain. I began studying uh, teen entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs that have created companies before finishing university. I have a database of more than 300 of them. And, and I use these examples with the students in Spain because sometimes using Steve Jobs and Mark Zuckerberg is not the best approach. So here we have examples of uh, entrepreneurs that they could feel represented by. Nula sapientes in experiencia. So at the end of the day, the idea is to practice. And that's, that's the type of learning, type, the type of education that we provide at a uh, university. Luz Reyes, he has this lecture. She was diagnosed at 11 years old. And at that moment, she decided that she wanted to solve this problem. She is a faculty here at Davis Business School. Um, basically, she became a linguistic. She learned artificial intelligence in her doctorate. And he developed two patents and a tool that can detect dyslexia in children from 8, 8 to 11 with 99% accuracy, which is amazing because in many countries, the children that, that, that uh, drop a school are so much, and many of them is because they have dyslexia not diagnosed. More ways to implement the stoicism in your everyday life. Create a diary. Write at the end of the day what was good, what was bad. Share, talk, discuss with other people with different ideas like you are today here in this webinar. Challenge yourself to improve doing things that you have never done before. Getting out of your comfort zone. Playing poker, for example. Or, I don't know, meditation is a very useful tool. We have a well-being department that I eat that, that work with all our students. Meditation is also an important part. Negative visualization, if you rather have a complicated, a complicated meeting, think in advance how the meeting is going to be. What is the stress or the, or the discussion or the argue that you may have with somebody else? And think about that, be prepared. So when you suffer, you have already uh, felt it, okay? There are things that you cannot control. This is the way to, to uh, calm down and be empathetic and understand that when this happens, you, you must focus on what you can have an impact on, okay? And nothing in life is important or as important as you think at that moment. I mean, sometimes we, we overthink, we lose perspective, and, and that's also something that some salespeople or, or some uh, players in tennis, they try to do. They try to make you think out of your plan, and when you are uncomfortable, then you are losing, not because you are worse, but because your brain is not working anymore. And where do we do all these things? We do them at our university uh, with this amazing building that is carbon neutral, uh, one of the top three vertical campus in the world. We have been doing this for 50 years, thanks to our founder, Diego Dalcazar, and we are now in the next 50 years thinking what is going to be the future. Uh, we do it in several schools, as I explained before, particularly in our school, we have this, this undergraduate and master programs. We do it with our pillars, innovation, entrepreneurial mindset, a diverse experience and humanities. So data, complex problem solving, entrepreneurship, diversity, and, and stoicism. And we do it with several programs. These are the programs 
that I run with three terms, 11 months, uh, rank it uh, as top of the world with a very diverse faculty from many different areas, from many different companies. We have most of our faculty coming from, from uh, companies. And well, with a set of electives and concentrations, certifications with immersion weeks. So you get coach world perspective with exchanges with other institutions from all over the world, with internships where the students practice what they have learned. Uh, with the Venture Lab, if you want to create a company instead of doing a capstone project with real impact projects that sometimes companies want to purchase from our students and focus on sustainability, we have a sustainability diploma on top of that. Um, yes, Masen, we have a PhD program in the business school, absolutely, with several tracks and a DBA, Doctorate in Business Administration. And finally, if all this is not enough, at least get this learning today after the conference. When you arise in the morning, think of what a precious privilege it is to be alive, to breathe, to think, to enjoy, to love, or to have this nice conversation about data, stoicism, and my book. Have I ever talked to you about my book? For whatever else that you need, I'm happy to share with you my contact. I hope that the conference was valuable for you. And if you have any doubt or any question, we open the mics and I will be happy to discuss it with you. All right, everyone. Uh, well, number one, I want to thank Guillermo uh, for joining us today. Uh, fantastic presentation. Uh, I really loved all the engagement that we were getting in the chat from everyone uh, and, and connecting with you and everything. Uh, really appreciate it. And I want to thank, again, everybody who joined uh, and who interacted with us and, and chatted and everything. Really appreciate it. Um, and thank you to everyone who just joined and, and watched. I really appreciate all of your time today. Yes, here's the contact of Flavia in the chat, in case you want the, the call on a business school PDF in English. Yes, hi, sorry. I'm, I'm just uh, hoping on top of um, representing Flavia because she needed to leave. I'm Beatrice, and I used to work closely with the Tagama Sigma before. Thank you, Gengi, Guillermo, for, for everything. And as, as you said, if you have any questions about our programs, about anything regards IE, just contact Flavia there or just contact Matt from Betagama Sigma and we will be happy to help you. Thank you. Well, thank you again, everyone. Uh, really appreciate you taking some time out of your day. Uh, I know for some of you, uh, it's very late at night. Uh, and for some of us, it's uh, in the middle of the day. Uh, but really appreciate you wherever you're joining us from. Really appreciate you coming in and joining us today. Uh, thank you once again, Guillermo. My pleasure. Take care, everyone.